Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Remy Bo. I'm a philosopher specializing uh, in environmental philosophy and environmental ethics. Um, I'm a researcher at CNRS in, in Paris and uh, my main purpose in, in this presentation uh, will be to give you some philosophical insights on what we can consider one of the most difficult challenges of, um, and for environmental studies. And that is uh, how to think and study ecosystem and societies, social systems and ecological systems as two interdependent systems. Uh, that's what I meant by that somewhat inelegant title, the coupling between social and ecological systems, theoretical and practical issues. So I, I will sketch out um, the main theoretical and practical issue that uh, this objective raises. Um, this will lead us to talk about some notions or concepts like such as uh, ecosystem services, nature's contribution to people, nature-based solution. And in this respect, uh, my, my main objective will be to place this notion um, in the theoretical framework um, in which they have been developed. And to, to highlight the ontological and anthropological assumptions uh, in which, um, on which they are based. Uh, so, and in the last part of, of the presentation, with this element in mind, these uh, ontological and anthropological assumptions, we'll then turn to more practical and political questions, namely, what can be achieved uh, with these theoretical tools, what can be achieved with ecosystem services approach, uh, why do this approach partially failed? Um, to trigger transformative changes and how can we try to use the lesson learned from this failure. Okay. Um, so, I will proceed uh, in three steps in my presentation. First, uh, by first examining the question why does the coupling between ecological and social system matter? Uh, why is this important? What, what does this imply? Uh, then I will address the question of the theoretical tools uh, to uh, link these systems, what methodology, what concepts. So it is on this occasion that uh, I will address the concept of ecosystem services and a nature-based solution, among other. And the idea is to define them to characterize the way in which they make it possible to enter this question of the, art of the articulation uh, of social and ecological system and above all to give an account of the debates that they have provoked, uh, of the criticism that uh, have been addressed to them and finally based on this criticism I will describe proposals uh, that defend the need to reorient approaches of the articulation between social and ecological system by moving away from the now well-established path of ecosystem services approach. So, uh, firstly, I start by looking at this question. Uh, why it's important to look for ways to uh, connect social and ecological systems? Well, the, the first reason is that it's not an obvious intention in the history of thought, and particularly in the Western history of thought. Uh, one, we can even say that a very strong tendency to do exactly the opposite has been present in Western thought uh, since antiquity. And it was considerably reinforced during scientific and philosophical modernity. This tendency aimed to separate what belongs to social world, what belongs to humanity, from what belongs to nature. And 
uh, in these respects, humans are humans because they are able to escape from nature. And society, in this regard, uh, obey its own laws and they do not depend on nature. And this way of thinking is far from favorable to the link, to think, to the thinking of the link between nature and society. Uh, firstly, I, I will recall uh, a few major sources of, uh, at the origin of this way of uh, thinking about the separation between humans and nature. We can think first uh, of what the American historian Lynn White Jr. Uh, put forward in a 1967 article entitled The Origins of the Environmental Crisis. In this uh, very controversial paper, Lynn White questioned Chris Christianity. Uh, he questions uh, Christianity because he thinks that Christianity is one of the main sources of the establishment of a relationship of domination between human and, nat and nature. From a reading of Genesis, he could affirm that Christianity was the most anthropocentric religion in the world. And see this, this quote from uh, Lynn White's article, and although man's body is made of clay, he is not simply part of nature, he is made in God's high image. And he adds a few lines later, Christianity is the most anthropocentric religion the world has seen. Not only it established the dualism of man and nature, but also insist, insisted that it is God's will that man exploit nature for his proper hands. So for Lean White, the dualism that has dominated Western thought is a Judeo-Christian legacy. A second major intellectual source of this point of view is to be found at the turn of the 16th and 17th century, which saw the advent of scientific and philosophical modernity. It's in particular the precept forged by Francis Bacon in the Novum Organum, uh, a work aiming uh, to lay the foundation of modern experimental uh, science, that the relation of domination to nature crystallizes. Domination becomes, in a way, the purpose of scientific research. And you can see uh, this quote very famous quote, if one were to endeavor to renew and enlarge the power and empire of mankind in general over the universe, such ambition, if it may be so termed, is both more sound and more noble than the other two. Many philosophers and thinkers working on environmental issues see in this Bacon statement the focus where a problematic relationship to nature is forged and permanently established. Then we are in France and we, we have to mention Descartes, René Descartes, the French philosopher who is presented as the great architect of uh, the dualism separating consciousness and matter, human subject and the rest of things. And Descartes is known in environmental thought for being the one who theorized the reduction of nature to matter, which would have somehow disenchanted nature. And seen in this quote, take it then first uh, that by nature here, he does not mean some deity or other sort of imaginary power, rather he uses the word to signify matter itself. So nature is just matter. Cartesian rationalism would mark the break with paganism or form of animism that admitted the existence of spirits in nature. And what uh, Descartes established in, the, in his book, The World, is that the rule of nature are entirely different from 
the law, the human laws. The rules by which these changes take place in nature are called the laws of nature. And they are entirely different of the human laws. And last but not least, uh, Emmanuel Kant. Uh, Kant, who, to complete this, this brief picture of modern thinkers, uh, Kant was uh, moral philosophy um, probably best expressed the, um, better than anyone uh, the separation between human moral subjects in their own rights and the rest of the beings. Uh, the rest of the beings in the world who are just assimilated to things. Only humans are endowed with intrinsic value that is, they count as ends uh, in themselves and not as mere means. They count uh, for themselves and not just for the utility they might have for other beings. And uh, regarding to the things, Kant explains that the, the difference between human and things is just in this that his dignity, the dignity of human being, consists by which he raises himself above all other beings in the world that are not human beings and yet can be used and so over all things. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by nature in Descartes' term? By nature for Descartes, what, uh, what does he refer to exactly? Yeah, he, he, he somewhat reduces nature to matter. Nature is just m matter. It's not uh, kind of uh, substance which could, um, wherein could inhabit some spirits or something that we can respect because there are, there are moral value in nature. There is moral value in nature. For Descartes, it's just matter. And it, 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 uh, it's a way to, uh, to have a reductionist conception of nature, which departs from ancient conception of nature, where you can find spirits or you can find just some other being that you have to respect. And uh, most um, very famously, um, uh, the, the fact that Descartes is often considered as um, an enemy for environmental philosopher uh, is linked to the way he treated animals. There's this famous thesis of the animal which are only considered as machine. And uh, it's uh, a, a huge mistake for environmental philosophy because it allows uh, to treat animals just as mere things. So that, that's one of the, the important steps in the history uh, regarding and to the the the, wa the way we we start to dominate nature. So uh, this great theoretical framework of modernity, which it should be noted now, uh, that does not account for the diversity of modern thinkers and must, must be understood as the deep just the deep intellectual trend of modernity. Uh, this, this framework was synthesized by uh, the French philosopher and sociologist uh, of sciences, Bruno Latour, uh, notably in his book, We Have Never Been Moderns, in 1991. Uh, late Latour paints a broad picture of a modernity that it's structured around two major divides. The first is the one that separates um, humans from nature within Western thought itself. It's the internal uh, divide on the left of the slide. And the second one is, is the one that establishes a separation between Western culture, supposedly embodying progress, universalism, modernity, and the other cultures defined as pre-modern because they do not yet separate humans from nature. So you see that if, if you 
If we believe Latour and many other uh, analysts of uh, modernity, one of the characteristic features of Western thought is to want to separate society from nature, to get humans out of their natural dependencies. So modernity would be animated by a great Promethean dream aiming by the development of the techniques to be sheltered from the contingency of nature. Uh, well, yeah. Before we move on, uh, in, in the previous slide, so this is also is the same as what Hobbes advances about the state of nature. And the yes, it, it, it's you, you, you can find this dualism in almost all the, um, the main philosopher, modern philosopher, and uh, particularly in uh, political philosophy. And the, the, it's all the theme of the social contract that, uh, uh, thanks to, to th this contract, humans. Uh, enters the realm of society and uh, escape from nature. Yeah, so it's, a, it's a modern, um, modern theme, uh, the, this, uh, this separation between humans and nature. And you, 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 have, uh, you can find the echo, the echo of the dualism in moral philosophy, in political philosophy, and in, in ontology, in modern ontology. And that's what uh, Latour established in We Have Never Been Moderns. However, uh, this ambition, which has been uh, criticized uh, a few, few times uh, in history, seemed definitely, uh, definitively sorry, untenable uh, at the beginning of the second half of the 20th uh, century when the environmental crisis uh, gained visibility and power. I will not go into the details of the burst of uh, this environmentalism in the 60s and 70s, because I think you, you've already heard about it, but I'll just provide a few reminders uh, about Rachel Carson's 1962 book, Silent Spring, and the Meadows Report, the Limits to Growth, uh, which was published in 1972. Uh, first, an excerpt from uh, Silent Spring, which addresses this uh, issue of the dependence of human lives on nature. For each of us, as for the robin in Michigan or the salmon in the Miramichi, this is a problem of ecology, of interrelationship, of interdependence. These are matters of record, observable, part of the visible world around us. They reflect the web of life or death that scientists know as ecology. So wh what Carson has powerfully established in this book is that we do depend on nature. Uh, we do depend on many ecological processes uh, and while these processes were invisible in our modern societies, the environmental crisis brings them to light. And that's why uh, uh, we need ecology. We need ecology to study this um, interdependencies, these ecological progress, uh, processes on which we depend. As for the, the Meadows report, well, you already know uh, the skull that introduced the idea that the infinite pursuit of economic growth in a world with finite natural resources in, is unsustainable. In other words, uh, Meadows and his colleagues use these curves to represent the, the dependence of human society on nature. In a way, Meadows and his colleague basically put forward the same idea, but they, they try to present it in a quantitative way. 
several years later, the notion of planetary boundaries uh, renewed the approach to the situation of interdependence between humans and nature. And this time, insisting from on the, the risk incurred by humanity uh, if they leave what is called a safe operating space characterized by conditions of habitability uh, of, the plane of the planet fav favorable to the development of human societies. And we, we note, and you probably know, that uh, several of these limits have already been crossed regarding uh, carbon and nitrogen cycle, biosphere, uh, biosphere integrity, uh, land conversion and climate change. So I, I, I insist on, on this notion of interdependence because it's important for understanding contemporary debates on the coupling, on the articulation between the social and ecological systems. Interdependence is undoubtedly the, the great message of the ecology of the, of the 60s and, and 70s. Uh, it is, for example, uh, what is put forward by Barry Commoners uh, in his book, The Closing Cycle. Uh, and in this book, he, he established what he calls uh, laws of ecology, the four laws of ecology. And uh, the first one is everything is connected to everything else. This sort of interdependence is the opposite of the modern ambition to detach ourselves from nature. On the, on the exact uh, contrary, ecological ecology invites us to understand that we cannot detach ourselves from nature and that we are strongly dependent on this large uh, number of ecological processes. Yeah. The way does uh, interdependence diverge from exploitation in the sense that <coughs> we may approach nature with respect because we need to respect nature in order to extract it. So we, we will keep extracting nature. We are not we don't respect nature for the sake of it, but we just respect nature so that we can keep using it. What is then the difference between interdependence in uh, in this way and the general inter interdependence? Hey, the, the, um, I would not say that uh, it's uh, um, in terms of difference between the two. The, the, the first thing is that the extractivist model, the, the way uh, modern society have exploited nature, was uh, based upon mod on a model that deny these dependencies. It, it, the fact that these, this exploitation was invisible because we used to live in this modern dream that society do not depend, societies do not depend on nature. So th the first step is to, to acknowledge the fact that the, the, the economic growth depends on nature, depends on the, the utilization of some uh, parts of nature. The first step, the second step, is to develop some more respectful uh, way to, co to, to, to cooperate with nature more than to uh, somewhat uh, brutally dominate it. And in terms of thought, uh, the notion of interdependence is also at the heart of the renewal that environmental ethics wish to embody, uh, following, uh, among others, the great precursor uh, that Aldo Leopold was, Amer the American forester and writer Aldo Leopold. Uh, we must think of ethics or morality not as something that raises us above other creatures, but as a guide that allows us to better cohabit with uh, all beings belonging to the symbiotic community. And in, in his famous book, A Sound County Almanac, 
uh, Leopold writes that we know now, we now know, know th what was unknown to all the preceding caravan of generation, that men are only fellow voyager with other creatures in the Odyssey of Evolution. And uh, with that uh, fact in mind, we should develop a new ethic, uh, thanks, um, according to Aldo Leopold. Uh, that's uh, exactly what um, the environmental, the field of environmental ethics uh, has tried to do a few years uh, later. Uh, the, the whole field of environmental philosophy that emerged at the end of the 60s undertook to reflect on what had been too neglected by moral modern philosophy, namely the relation between humans and nature, between humans and animals, and all other living beings or living environments. And this is what um, the Australian philosopher Richard Rutley uh, indicates in uh, his article, his 1973 article uh, published in the journal Environmental Ethics, uh, in which he positioned himself against human chauvinism. And he, he says, it is increasingly said that civilization, Western civilization at least, stands in need of a new ethic setting out people's relation to the natural environment. In Leopold's word, an ethic dealing with man's relation to land and to the animal and plants which grow upon it. It's not, of course, that old and prevailing ethics do not deal with man's relation to nature. They do, and on the prevailing view, man is free to deal with nature as he pleases that is, his relation with nature, insofar as, at least as they do not affect others, are not subject to moral censure. So, uh, Richard Rutley and environmental ethics wants to, want to change that, uh, that, uh, that fact, the, the fact that animals, plants, ecosystems are not uh, um, are not considered uh, uh, have worse, uh, um, in moral modern philosophy, we consider that they don't have any moral value. They don't have any intrinsic value. And they want to overcome what they think uh, as human chauvinism or anthropocentrism. And that's what they, what they wanted to do um, in the 60s and the, s and the 70s. So, finally, we, we must also mention the, the important work of the anthropologist, the French anthropologist Philippe Descola, on Western ontology and naturalism, uh, the questioning of the universality of the concept of nature and of the dualistic representation of the world, uh, radically separating humans from nature, and constituted an important step on the way to uh, taking into account the fact that human societies are always embedded in a system of relation with non-human. And um, in his book, Beyond Nature and Culture, the scholar claimed that the environment is not uh, regarded objectively as an autonomous sphere in many other uh, cultures uh, and that's naturalism, that the problem of naturalism, this separation uh, between nature and, and culture. Yeah. Uh, but uh, these uh, philosophical movements were not motivated at the time by climate change? No, mm, not yet, not yet. Climate change uh, became a, a, a real issue in, at the end of the 80s uh, in environmental thinking. Yeah. yeah, the 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 on the ecologist the ecological critique uh, of uh, modern societies uh, initially uh, aimed at 
um, the industrialization of uh, societies and so it's we you can find some criticism of modern society modern developments uh, at least um, uh, from the beginning of the the end of the 18th century but uh, and we will move on uh, the, the this topic the climate change topic really uh, was well really taken into account in environmentalism at the end of the 80s. Um, for, so, for nearly 60 years, years, ecological thinking had been inviting us to rethink uh, the relationship between humans and nature and has been highlighting the dependence of societies on nature. And in so doing, they, they affirm that it's vain to want to study and understand human societies without asking the question of the relations that these maintain with nature. They affirm, in other words, that there is no autonomy of the social in relation to nature. But still, uh, far from having disappeared, the Promethean dream of decoupling is still very much alive. It continues to inhabit the advocates of economic growth that would allow the decoupling of the increase in human well-being from the increase of the consumption of natural resources. In the same way, uh, dualism continues to underlie economic or political model based on assumption of strong substitutability, which see in technological development the possibility of making the technosphere increasingly autonomous from its material base. So they, they expect to, that we could raid human well-being and decouple the this this right de decouple the, the human uh, the, the economic growth from environmental impacts and that this uh, uh, this decoupling is uh, would be the solution to environmental issues this um, this idea ideas as are strongly promoted today uh, by various current of thought, including the eco-modernist current, which is uh, a current of thought that brings together researchers and experts working on environmental issues and have the ambition to renew environmentalism. Uh, the thesis of decoupling is indeed their main argument. Uh, in favor of the continued development of economic growth and technological development. And they, they wrote a manifesto, the Eco-Modernist Manifesto, uh, the, and they write in this manifesto, decoupling of human welfare from environmental impacts will require a sustained commitment to technological progress and the continuing evolution of social, economic and political institutions alongside those changes. And they add, plentiful access to modern energy is an essential prerequisite for human development and for decoupling development from nature. So, that's why uh, I say that the dream of decoupling is more alive than, than never. And I therefore wanted to emphasize at the end of this first part the fact that despite the relative rise in power of environmentalist discourses and environmental thinking, the thesis that in order to study and understand human societies, social and ecological system must be brought together, must be articulated, is still, is still sorry, not obvious, not evident at all. 
And consequently, we must keep in mind that program researchers seeking to develop integrative approaches, if they have flaws, and, and we will talk about, uh, about them, they have this great merit of trying to counter the ideology of decoupling. And uh, we, we have to, to, to keep this in mind when we um, study this, um, these approaches. These approaches. So I now come to the, the way of trying to appreciate uh, social and ecological systems together. Uh, to try to, 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 to reconnecting this system and therefore of uh, breaking with the way of uh, doing things that consist of separating uh, study of human system on the one side and the study of the ecosystem of, on the other side. Um, it is therefore a question of thinking about the links between human activities and ecological processes uh, within the same system, which we can call socio-ecological systems. And we often find this type of uh, figure indicating two interacting subsystems, the human system and ecosystem. And uh, this is precisely where ecosystem services appear. The idea of ecosystem services asserts that the human species and the physical environment and sorry, that the, 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 the human species is a stakeholder in a network of interdependencies between species and between species and the physical environment. And it invites the quantification of resources and of the different contribution provided by an ecosystem to humans. To, to, to define this, this notion, uh, we can refer to the synthesis of, uh, proposed in the report of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, uh, which was um, carried out between 2001 and 2005. And the, the goal was to assess the consequences of ecosystem change for human well-being and to establish the scientific basis for actions needed to enhance the conservation and sustainable use of ecosystem and their contribution to human well-being. And in this report, you, you find a, a, a series of a fairly clear definition, definition of an ecosystem, and a, a more precise definition of ecosystem services, which are the benefits people obtain from ecosystems. Yes. Placing like humans above the rest of the part because it's like the ecosystem services is because they serve humankind and the ecosystem is something that we that can alter. But we like I don't see like any like um, egalitarianism in a way. It's still under this framework, everything is very anthropocentric. Yeah. So. A very good question, and, and it's uh, like, uh, for example, I don't know how much you know about the Incas cosmovision. Like uh, they had this idea that you have this, you have nature, uh, humans, and uh, Pachamama, Mother Earth, and they were all intertwined and interrelated, and they all had a soul. Like mountains had a soul, and the sun had a soul. Like, and w it was not a system where one dominated the other, but they all lived at the same level, which is not something I'm seeing in either these nor other ecological uh, views, yeah. Like yeah. views and yeah, yeah. Uh, It's a, a very good comment and I'll come to, to this uh, criticism in a, in a few slides. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> because, uh, no, no, it's, it's okay. It's, it's obviously um, an approach which remains anthropocentric. anthropocentric. And it's one of the um, difficulties that uh, we, will, um, we will address. And it's, it's one of the main reasons 
uh, of the the fact that ecosystem services were uh, were not satisfying for our environmental philosopher and but I, I don't want to 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 to, to um, uh, say too much uh, about this criticism now because uh, I, I will come to this point in uh, in a moment but it, it's it's uh, your comment is um, quite interesting because it's it's one of the main feature of ecosystem services that they are they still are thought in an anthropocentric model yeah. approach right I really don't understand the, like what you just said in the sense that I think it goes without saying that humans are like superior to animals. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't understand why we need to emphasize the equality. Yes, we could care about animals and care about nature, but it doesn't like imply that we are like the same because obviously we are not. Um, you you don't have to 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 necessary to to think that we are equal uh, with animals. That's that was not my point. My point is to consider to consider that animals are um, morally valuable. That they have an intrinsic value, and that does not mean that they have the same value. Uh, as humans, uh, some some thinkers uh, uh, defend defend the uh, somewhat egalitarian point of view about uh, humans and animals, and they they, they defend um, uh, that approach. But for the moment, my my point is just to acknowledge the fact that they have moral value. And just uh, it's just that point. Um, so the the uh, come back to the the definition of ecosystem services, which are the benefits people obtain from ecosystems, and these include, uh, if you read the the report, these include provisioning services such as food, water, timber, and fiber. Regulating services that affect climate, fluids, disease, waste, and water quality, cultural services, and supporting services such as uh, soil formation, photosynthesis, and nutrient cycling. Uh, we can define four broad uh, categories of uh, ecosystem services uh, that are usually uh, distinguished. Uh, and the, the, the main point is that these ecosystem services are linked to a constituent of well-being, of human well-being. And so the, the ecosystem services approach uh, try to highlight this dependency of human well-being uh, regarding ecosystem services. Just a, a few a few words about the rise of uh, this approach. Uh, it has been introduced uh, in the in the eighties, nineteen eighties, and the concept has gradually gained acceptance in the world of uh, nature protection and management. It is mentioned in the nineteen ninety two Convention on Biological Diversity. But the, the first major study to introduce the concept into the public arena was undoubtedly uh, the one that uh, uh, Costanza and his colleague, his colleague carried out in 1997. Uh, Costanza published an article in which he proposed to quantify the total value of the services provided by all the planet's ecosystems. And uh, the amount was 33 trillion per dollar per year. And the, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Initiative, commissioned by the United Nations Environment 
program, which I've already mentioned, then contributed greatly uh, to the development of the approach. So 2005, the report was published in 2005. And then we should also mention the TEEB, the Ecos Economics of Ecosystem and Biodiversity Program, uh, supported by the European Commission, which has also integrated the ecosystem services approach into its biodiversity strategy. The biodiversity strategy to, to uh, 2020. And finally, the notion uh, uh, is initially at the heart of the creation in 2012 of the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES. And you can see that also it's far from being hegemonic from the point of view of economic approaches in general. The notion of ecosystem services has become dominant in the world of nature management and nature protection. Many promises uh, were uh, attached to uh, this notion and to this uh, approach. Uh, its promoters point out several assets. First, uh, it responds well to the need to highlight the critical role ecosystem and biodiversity play in sustaining life, human well-being and long-term economic sustainability. Then it appears at, as a, a conceptual tool with the capacity to make environmental externalities explicit and a basis for the design of policy mechanism uh, intended to internalize the value of such externalities in market transaction and decision-making processes. And finally, in terms of research, in, uh, of research programs, uh, it, they, they can promote dialogue between academic disciplines and improve communication between interest groups as different as, as farmers, economists, policymakers, and entrepreneurs. But at the same time, uh, this theoretical framework um, within which ecosystem services uh, are situated um, and the practical implication of their uh, use raises many questions. Uh, and this question uh, will give rise to a long and lively debate that is still going on about uh, this approach. And in this figure, uh, you, you can see a certain number of, uh, of these questions, which are at once epistemological, ethical and political. Uh, for which purpose is the concept used, who bear the cost, who benefits, what constitutes well-being, uh, how can we measure and or monetize benefits, who decides, what is included, what is excluded. And you have there's many questions, uh, at the same time epistemological, political and ethical. And a vast uh, literature uh, has been built up to try to answer these questions. And I, I, I'm not going to go into the details of this literature, but rather to, to put forward some uh, salient points. Uh, salient point, uh, uh, points and strong criticism. And we, we have already mentioned one of these uh, criticisms, uh, but they are ordered. The ecosystem services approach has been strongly criticized uh, for its uh, blind spots and for the risks it poses to nature conservation. In France, uh, among many other works, we can cite the book by the philosopher Virginie Maris, Nature à vendre les limites des services écosystémiques, Nature for Sale, The Limits of Ecosystem Services, and a more recent book by the economist Ellen Todgeman, uh, La croissance verte contre la nature, uh, green growth against nature. And in general, the main criticisms are as follows. Ecosystem services 
approach adopts a utilitarian perspective and tends to reduce the value of nature to its instrumental values. First critique. Second one. This approach situates the protection of nature and biodiversity into an explicit economic framework, which is orthodox neoclassical economy. Then, ecosystem services encourage the commodification of nature and the transformation of all possible environmental values into a single unit of exchange or a single metric. Another uh, criticism that uh, ecosystem services privilege quantifiable services over qualitative relational aspects. And finally, uh, Ecosystem services could be a Trojan horse for monetization. Uh, these uh, difficulties uh, encountered by, by the approach, both in terms of criticism, of the, the criticism uh, we've just seen, and the difficulties uh, in operationalizing it, uh, gave rise to new concepts in nature protection policies. First of all, uh, the concept of nature-based solution. The idea of nature-based solution uh, is introduced at the end of the 2000s by the World Bank and IUCN. Um, and the goal is to highlight the importance of biodiversity conservation for climate change mitigation and adaptation. It's the subject of um, the following definition. For the IUCN, it is the potential power of nature and the solutions it can provide to global challenges in fields such as climate change, food security, social and economic development. And for the European Commission, nature-based solutions honor the power and sophistication of nature to turn environmental, social, and economic challenges into innovation opportunities. And this approach, the, the nature-based solution approach, uh, is now adopted by European Commission for its research program. Uh, it has been uh, adopted for its research program Horizon 2020. Um, so the, the question we, we could ask is, do nature-based solutions really represent a paradigm shift, a real shift? For some analysts, far from marking a real reorientation with respect to the ecosystem services approach, nature-based solutions seem to have been conceived mainly with a view to operationalize ecosystem services approach. And, and the word solution in the, in the expression nature-based solution. And it's, it's a question of, it's mainly a question of multiplying the means of implementing program based on resources and services provided by ecosystems. So the notion thus raised, raises much uh, the same fears from the point of view of the economic and political model in which it seems to have to fit at the one raised by ecosystem services approach. Another proposal has more recently emerged in the context of the IPBS work, that of nature's contribution to people. Again, with the aim of analyzing the interdependence between social and ecological systems, and this new approach, it tends this time to respond more explicitly to some of the criticism addressed to ecosystem services. So it was introduced by IPBS in 2014, but really developed in a 2018 report with the aim of overcoming, uh, with the explicit aim of overcoming some important limitation of the ecosystem services approach from the point of view of potential exclusion of certain stakeholders, worldviews or knowledge systems. It therefore um, aims to develop a more inclusive 
theoretical framework for human nature relationships. <coughs> We, we can say that the, the main changes at first sight are in the vocabulary, replacing service by contribution, which is a way to take some distance uh, from economic vocabulary, economical vocabulary, as well as in the willingness to take cultural aspects and the diversity of knowledge more seriously. Now, there is um, a, an important uh, uh, goal with an uh, in nature contribution to people approach, which is to take into account a large diversity of, uh, of knowledge, uh, which was not the case in ecosystem services approach. So some authors have recently tried to highlight the main contribution of the NCP framework to the ecosystem services uh, framework. Uh, this is what is represented on this slide and what is uh, highlighted in the conceptual claims that we find in NCP approach and that we do not find in ecosystem services approach is the importance of the context specific perspective, the diverse world views, the relational values and the inclusive language and, and framing. So, we can say that nature contribution uh, to people is an improvement uh, regarding uh, these points, but uh, at the same time, uh, while some emphasizes the, the changes brought about by this new theoretical framework, others tend to question the fact that it embodies a real novelty. In this, uh, in this sense, uh, Muradian and Gomez Bagatun in 2021 speak of the Fauna syndrome about nature contribution to people. And uh, they write, uh, this, mm, instead of an internally consistent alternative, the NCP approach looks as a hybrid whose features are not enough to set the basis for a new way of conceiving human nature relations. From this point of view, the, the NCP approach, the nature contribution to people approach, would not really embody a real paradigm shift, but again, rather a simple name change, a, a change of name. Though this multiplication of concepts that claim to renew the approach, the appro the approach without transforming the general theoretical framework, also raises questions among researchers and managers. Should we continue to invent new concepts to compensate for the inadequacies of previous ones? Or should we rather take stock of the actions carried out according to this general framework and perhaps radically change them? Uh, from this point of view, the testimony of uh, researcher Aiden Washington, published in a recent article, is quite exemplary. In this paper, he looks back on 20 years of development of the ecosystem services approach and question the progress made. It starts uh, like this. The last 20 years have seen enormous discussion of natural capital and ecosystem services. Yet, despite this, the environmental crisis has worsened, as have prospects for the long-term conservation of nature. It may be that through ecosystem services, some decision makers are now more aware that society is completely dependent on nature. And that was the point uh, of ecosystem services. And thus, some decisions may have been better than they might otherwise, otherwise have been. But we should ask how ecosystem services relate to eco-justice. <coughs> One can only conclu conclude, not well. All the stakeholders for natural capital and ecosystem services are human stakeholders, and the benefits come only to humans. And that's why it remains anthropocentric. Do ecosystem services relate any better to social justice? 
at first glance, if their focus on benefits to humans may suggest this. However, the fact that ecosystem services ignore benefits to nature means that over time biodiversity will continue to decline with consequent impacts on society, especially the poor. The benefit of ecosystem services to social justice are thus questionable. Similarly, ecosystem services do not help reconcile the two justice, social and ecological. So, perhaps it is time to consider that if the worldview and ethics that define ecosystem services were flawed, the term itself may be also. And he had a few lines later. Ecosystem services thus remain a conflicted term and certainly cannot be considered one that foregrounds ecocentrism and ecojustice. It may be one more Trojan horse of anthropocentrism within the conservation community. So very strong criticism of the ecosystem services approach. So Washington, among other researchers, asked, should we not radically review the way we seek to understand the interdependence between humans and nature? And consequently, return to the basic assumption that accompanied the development of ecosystem services, then nature-based solution, and finally NCP. And this is what I, I propose to analyze in my last point, the third part of my presentation, on other possible ways of thinking about human-nature relations. Indeed, for, for some researchers, it seems necessary to revise the theoretical framework in which these approaches are inscribed because they do not uh, finally meet the expectation expressed by the environmentalist critique uh, that appeared in the 60s and 70s. And the, the one that uh, I briefly described at the beginning of my presentation. According to them, there are several reasons for this, for this failure. First of all, this framework remains rooted in dualism and despite the efforts made by IPBS, the struggles to, to, to take into account the diversity of knowledge and conception of the world, it remains dualistic. It also remains strongly anthropocentric, focusing mainly on what is useful to humans and to societies. It has thus been repeatedly pointed out that is, these approaches do, uh, do not take into account the, intrin the intrinsic value of nature, uh, a point which is very important for environmental ethicists and environmental philosophers. But another point, uh, is stressed by some environmental philosophers and economists. This is the fact that environmental ethics is the bearer not only of a new way of thinking about nature, but also a radical critique of the anthropology of neoclassical economy. And that there is therefore a paradox in wanting to translate the, message, the, the, the main message of ecology into the categories of this same neoclassical economy. Environmental ethics are not simply ethics that emphasize the intrinsic value of nature, they say. They also reflect on who we are as dependent human beings attached to other humans and non-humans, far from the economist image of the rational agents. This is a point that has been well described by the economist Clive Spash in his work, and in particular uh, in an article with the ironic title How Much is That Ecosystem in the Window? which is a tribute to the work of a philosopher specializing in environmental issues, Alan Holland. Spash returns to the initial choice that guided much of the ecosystem services approach, uh, which was to defend the idea that 
Rezoning must be based on the anthropology of the rational idiot who acts only in the name of money he can earn. Uh, in this article, uh, he quotes Costanza, Costanza, one of the father of the ecosystem services approach, uh, who uh, writes in uh, 2006, I do not agree that more progress will be made by appealing to people's hearts rather than their wallets. And hold on, uh, Alan Holland comments uh, this, uh, this quote. So an implicit model of human motivation underlies the money argument for conservation. That is psychological egoism. That is the claim that people are incapable of regarding as important anything other than their own interest. And uh, Spash uh, add that this anthropological assumption then determines how we think about the formation of value judg judgment that can guide public policy. And that's why he claimed that in ecosystem services approach, the problem is how judgment is concealed and used to frame public policy. And the problem is the fact that this ignores the many ways in which human, humans operate outside such system and without being psychological egoist whose only concern is their wallet. So he wants to depart from this way of uh, thinking uh, of framing public policy and of thinking human humans, human beings. So it's, it's an anthropological thesis. According to this view, if we really want to reorient the approach of the interdependence between humans and nature, we have to return to the criticism made by certain environmental philosophers at least since the 70s. From this point of view, the work of Caroline Merchant, a historian and, and, and philosopher, American historian and philosopher, is particularly interesting. And notably, his book Radical Ecology, published in 1992. In this book, Merchant starts from a general reflection on ethics to propose a typology of moral theories based on the type of the good they seek to promote. Uh, referring to Aristotle, she writes, in his Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle noted that all knowledge and every pursuit, pursuit aims at some good. But whether this is an individual, social or environmental good lies at the basis of <coughs> of many real-world ethical dilemma. Egocentric, homocentric, and ecocentric ethics often underlie the political position of various interest groups engaged in struggle over land and natural resources, and natural resource uses. These ethics are the culmination of sets of associated political, religious, and ethical trends developing in Western culture since the 17th century. And uh, so Karen Merchant argued that environmental issues can be approached, approached ethically in different ways, depending on whether one adopts a theory centered on the self, on the society, the cosmos, or the ecological community. And based on these criteria, she proposes a mapping of the different authors and currents, currents of thought. So uh, I'm not going to, to, to comment um, on the wall figure, but the, the aim is rather to, to point out the, parad the paradox that I mentioned earlier, which consists... Yes? Um, I'm just looking at this and we're talking about like, ethics and language, yeah. and, and it's a big issue, the use of language. And I'm looking at this and I don't see if any indigenous or writers um, and that language is never put into academic papers so I mean I just want to I want to make a comment that that if if language is truly important 
that there should be more indigenous writers, um, academics that are included in the, in these kinds of, of lists, and and so their language can become normalized because a lot of the language that's now in the current literature actually is sometimes very abrasive to indigenous um, academics, and they find it um, they find it almost offensive because the words used are so human centered that to them to their culture it is it is um, highly offensive. Yeah, you, you, you raise uh, an important point, and, and it's perfectly true that uh, mentioned in this uh, table, uh, just mentioned uh, with the term partnership, multicultural partnership, uh, that that, uh, that question, but do not mention their names. They're omitted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're just considered as a group, but they're largely omitted. They're lacked. The yeah. But if, if, you, if you look um, at the, the main goal of uh, Caroline Merchant in, in this book is to, to map the way um, uh, Western thought uh, <coughs> are uh, uh, um, develop uh, some ethics about the relation between human and nature. And, and so uh, you, you are perfectly right that she, she we need to, to add uh, those names. But in, in this picture, she wanted to show that um, in, the, in the history of Western thought, you have mm, those different positions. And after, when she, uh, uh, she makes this list of authors and thinkers that uh, are in the column of partnership and multicultural, multicultural she should add uh, she should have add, added the, the, the this name I, you're right um, but the, 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 the main point here is to show that maybe we should reframe entirely the way we approach this interdependence and in order to reframe this, uh, we probably should rely more on uh, other cultural views of, uh, of nature or environment. Yeah. Uh, so, she, she based on this uh, criteria, criteria she, she proposed uh, this mapping, and uh, the paradox she, she, she highlights is that uh, Ecosystem services approaches or, or nature-based solution approaches consist in wanting to think about the profound reorganization of our way of life, of our mode of, produ of production of, uh, and consumption, which the recognition of our interdependence with nature calls for within the theoretical framework of egocentrism. The, 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 the thinkers and the, and the current of thought that are on the left of uh, this table. And uh, as uh, uh, described by Merchant, we, we can define a, an egocentric. Yes? Uh, could you explain, please, the position related to the eco feminism which was in the utilitarian column before, table before? So the utilitarian, they had left greens and uh, social ecofeminists, um, because I imagine that uh, there is a huge gap probably that between the ecofeminists and John Stuart Mill, for example. And uh, yep. what, uh, uh, what's the problem? Actually, there, there, are, there are many um, many points that are controversial uh, on the about the way she classifies. Uh, some author in that column or uh, other column. Because uh, if you see uh, that uh, Val Plumwood, for example, uh, who is uh, uh, one of the main author of ecofeminism, uh, she, she puts uh, uh, her name in the column partnership multicultural and not utilitarian. Uh, although uh, e social ecofeminists are in the utilitarian column. So that's why I, I, I will not um, really uh, present the details of this table because it's quite controversial. But the, the main point is that you have different ways 
to conceive ethics uh, to, to big way like egocentrism, homocentrism, ecocentrism, and eco-community. And the fact that the, the ecological criticism, uh, mainly in the 60s and 70s, were mainly situated in the right of this table, on the right of this table. And we try to uh, translate this intuition, this criticism, within the categories of egocentrism or homocentrism. And that is, for, for Carolyn Merchant, the paradox. And that is the, the paradox of uh, ecosystem services approach. And she, 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 she insists upon the fact that, historically, the egocentric ethic rose to dominance in Western culture during the 17th century. Uh, the classic ethic of liberalism and laissez-faire capitalism. In America, it has been the guiding, uh, she, she, it's a quote, in America, it has been the guiding ethic of private entrepreneur and corporation whose primary goal is the maximization of profit from the development of natural resources. And on the opposite side of the, of the table, you find the ecocentric and eco-community approaches and are non anthropocentric ethics, they are defined by their defense of the idea that environment as a whole and all forms of life have a moral value that must be taken into account. Animals, plants, but also ecological walls or communities have a moral value and count for themselves, not only human beings, as Kant uh, had established. But in reality, non-anthropocentric ethics contain more than the acknowledgement of the intrinsic uh, value of nature. Just uh, as, like I said uh, in the beginning of, the uh, of this uh, third part, they address issues like the complexity of nature-culture relation, the responsibilities to women, minorities and non-human nature, issue, issues of environmental, environmental justice. And they can also be described as a way of thinking about the relational nature of human beings on an ontological and anthropological level. What does this mean? Well, the, the classical representation of moral agents in egocentric theories describes relationship between individuals considered as social, isolated, and independent atoms. Ecocentrism is in stark contrast to this atomicist conception of moral beings and instead defends a relational conception. And in, in this sense, Calicut, who is uh, an important environmental philosopher, that Calicut writes, what is a moral being? A moral being is not a ghost in a machine, not an ego enclosed in a bag of skin, not a calculati calculating, endeavor-driven, preference-satisfying social atone. As prefigured by Carol Gilligan to be a moral being is to be a unique node in or nexus of a multi-dimensional web of relationships. So, from this point of view, the criticisms of ecosystem services approach question the sense of wanting to reintegrate this thesis and critical positioning into the theoretical framework of egocentrism. For, as we've seen, to a large extent, the ecosystem service, the ecosystem services approach can be seen as seeking to make room for this concern within the existing framework of egocentrism or moral utilitarianism when the approaches are willing to concern themselves with social, social justice. And in its 2019 report, 
the IPBS states that goals for conserving and sustainably using nature and achieving sustainability cannot be met by current trajectories and goal for 2030 and beyond may only be achieved through transformative changes. Transformative changes across economic, social, political and technological factors. And the, the report defines transformative change as a fundamental system-wide reorganization across technological, economic and social factors. And that includes paradigms, goals and values. So what is suggested by Caroline Merchant's analysis is that these changes will not come from a right to left movement uh, on, on the table, but from a left to right movement on the figure. And transformative changes would come from a, a change uh, that uh, within we pass from egocentrism to eco-community or ecocentrism uh, worldview. So to, to conclude, uh, I would say that the concepts used to, to study the links between social and ecological systems, such as ecosystem services, nature-based solution, nature's contribution to people are ambivalent. For their advocates, they are mostly neutral, neutral tools, useful for linking nature and society. And in the context of the Anthropocene, they, they provide a scientific basis for building more sustainable societies. That, uh, that is the, the, the discourse of the, the advocates of ecosystem services approach. But for their opponents, while originally pursuing a loadable goal, these tools have proven to be obstacles to real transformative changes by promoting the statu quo, status quo regarding the economic and political model in which we attempt to respond to the ecolog ecological challenges of our time. And that's why they wanted to more radically reorient the way we conceive the articulation between social and ecological systems. And that was my conclusion, and I would be happy to answer your question if you have any question. No question at all. <laughs> Okay. Do you, did you know uh, something about environmental philosophy or environmental ethics? Yes. But what uh, what current of thought? Which current of thought? The the well the multicultural multicultural part of the reflection or the American. Environmental philosophy? No. Yeah. Sorry, but yeah. environmental ethics, do you mean concepts like um, commodification of the environment, emission trading scheme, and the moral justification of, for example, emission trading, the ETS of EU, um, carbon taxes, and those? Is that what you're referring to? No. no um, uh, environmental ethics is a, a, a philosophical current, a subdomain of philosophy. Um, which main goal is to radically reframe the way we uh, usually think about the relation between humans and nature or humans and animals uh, or plants. And the, um, the starting point of the uh, discipline of, the, of environmental ethics was that um, in modern moral philosophy, Animal, plants, nature uh, were almost entirely invisible. And uh, uh, just uh, like um, 
just as uh, Kant had established, because they are not worthy of uh, dignity, they, 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 are, they, they just don't have any moral value. So th that's, uh, that's what uh, uh, precisely uh, try to criticize and to overcome that what environmental ethics wants to overcome. But for all the generation for people back in the 15th, 16th century, nature means uh, uh, bears, means death, it means uh, diseases, it means uh, basically it means everything bad. So perhaps their approach to nature was uh, from their experience, from what they saw of nature, they saw really the ugly, survived face of nature, whereas we are seeing really the beautiful things the parts that, that were really meant to maintain the everything. Yes. You, you want to, to, to insist uh, on the fact that um, uh, we, we the representation of nature uh, has varied in, in history and, and you we have now uh, a cultural view uh, on on nature and particularly on the uh, the, the nature we want to defend the nature the the beautiful nature in uh, in national parks and and in in, in this uh, in these reserves uh, but um, I'm not sure that you can say that in the past. Um, Humans um, only well were only afraid of nature and they did not relate to nature. They they, they worked with animals. They they were um, in many way uh, closer to 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 nature. And I don't think that it's a fair uh, description of uh, these societies. I come from there is really this uh, this this generational divide <coughs> because back in, in my country Mauritania we have that young people love to go back to the say the desert to go away from the city to relax and have fun whereas old people generally hate nature because they say that they grow up there it's really hard it's difficult to have me in the city you have uh, air conditioning you have food you have water you have everything and back there it's really tough so old people don't like nature young, young people like nature so my idea comes from here is that their their approach to nature is because of their personal history and not like out of some philosophical you, you you raise a, a very important point that, that um this point is the fact that in nature uh, conservation, in, in the way uh, in, um, in the Western world we have uh, conceived uh, nature conservation uh, and notably by creating uh, national parks or reserves, um, it was a way to um, expand one cultural view of nature on other parts of the world. But my point here is to say that there are many ways to conceive nature but, uh, or non-humans or environments. And it's, uh, I, I didn't want to say that we have to, to follow uh, the path of um, imposing that uh, representation of nature like, um, such as the wilderness and, and, and the, the, the nature we defend in national parks. Th this um, this uh, environmental policies um, uh, were uh, very problematic in the in the way uh, uh, they have been imposed uh, to to some uh, other culture. But the the point is just 
to overcome the anthropocentrism that was uh, the main feature of uh, modern philosophical thought. Uh, but uh, your point I I is important. Uh, it's the fact that the, represent the representations of nature are cultural and located in, in, in uh, geographically and historically situated. And it's a very important point. That's why um, if you think uh, about the way uh, Karen Merchant uh, described uh, the eco-community approach, uh, she uh, insists uh, on the fact that we have to include, not enough, but to include cultural diversity. Are there any other questions? Yeah. I just have a, a comment on this. I mean, yeah. I, I, the start of the presentation, you talked about the spiritual aspects and all that. So I, um, I've been working with some rewilding groups and some indigenous communities. This is why, uh, particularly, it's interesting to me. But one of the things that we've been discussing is using language uh, that that sh that does shift it from <coughs> not just like humans that can control the environment, which we can, but. Uh, Rather than like a service, like nature is not a service, or not not. It's more of we have a responsibility to it. And then there are silent stakeholders, such as animals, such as plants, that are responsible for the balance of the ecosystem. And so that language needs to be put in uh, philosophically, but also at a po political or policy level. So I guess my question is. In this, uh, in like this philosophy, mm. where do you see channels for for this to be implemented? I mean, it's great to study it and to add to this body of knowledge, but where can it take action so that that narrative is changed um, on the economic, business, you know, those levels? Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's a good question. Uh, um, what is that? My, my goal here was to, to show why ecosystem services approach, nature-based solution, have to change uh, uh, the, um, their main orientation, the way they think uh, that they could be useful, that this approach could be useful to, um, to help to, to build some public policies in order to, to answer um, uh, environmental crisis or climate cli crisis, etc. Et um, but and and at the same time, to 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 that they they have to escape from a model uh, in which scientists uh, study the ecosystem, the socio ecological uh, systems, and uh, give some data to. Uh, political uh, policy makers that uh, they can use and, and, and they can they can uh, uh, build uh, some uh, some policies uh, this model I think uh, has failed and and we are still uh, attached to, to the ecosystem services approach are still attached to, to this model other avenues to, to, to think of the of the proposition uh, could be um, uh, could be find, uh, found in uh, some conservation-based uh, 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 um, uh, attempt to reframe uh, nature conservation, for example. That means a more horizontal uh, a way to think uh, the reorganization of the uh, interdependence between humans and nature. Um, other ways are the uh, pursuit, as a pursuit of a more radical democracy. Uh, I think it's it's uh, uh, really deeply political when you understand that you depend on many of the beings that just uh, only humans. And in order to translate this uh, this recognition, the the, the acknowledgement that uh, uh, we depend on many of the beings that, that humans, you have to reframe the whole way we think about society and about politic, politics. And, and 
that's why we, we, we can think about uh, some, some uh, ex experimentation or, or ID um, such as the parliaments of non-humans uh, uh, of Bruno Latour. The, the way uh, that we can give a representation to animals, plants, to other uh, other beings, and I think that it's not uh, it's not uh, um, only a philosophical uh, reflection on uh, what counts for themselves or, or for uh, for itself or, or not. It's it has some uh, some uh, political consequences if we want to, to, to implement this, this recognition of the, the moral values of nature. But uh, uh, the, the, the main point here was to insist on the fact that while many researchers, many scientists are still uh, pursuing uh, the... are still... Uh, the, the hope that ecosystem services approach will truly uh, allow ourselves to find solutions, uh, to find nature-based solutions, I think the, the, this hope is misplaced. And so th that was the main, the main point uh, of, of the talk. And after that, we, there are, uh, we have a lot of work to rethink a political organization which really take into account the other forms of living beings. And to do that, we, 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 should, uh, we should take some inspira inspiration uh, from other culture, other way. The, the, um, the works of uh, Philippe Descola uh, about uh, animism, about um, uh, all the uh, ontologies um, is really important uh, uh, on that matter. But uh, I, I think the first step uh, would be to depart from the, 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 the now, nowadays, really well-established path of ecosystem service, uh, services approach, which is dominant, really dominant. Other questions? No. So if you don't have any other question, just have to thank you and I think we can stop here.